Hello everyone. This is chapter 5 in section 1.0, which we call the normal probability distributions. And in section 5.1, we get introduced to normal distributions and what we call the standard normal distribution. Uh, first off, a continuous random variable um, has an infinite number of values and can be a represented by an interval on a number line and we'd seen that in the past and uh, when we looked at discrete versus continuous and um, a probability distribution for a continuous random variable is um, what we call continuous probability distribution now the normal distribution is special um, the graph is what we call the normal curve, and it's the most important distribution we're going to study. And it has the following properties. Mean, median, mode are all equal, and they're located in the center. It's symmetric about the mean. The total area is equal to 1 or 100% and there's what we call asymptotes for the pure mathematics fan never touches the x-axis as it extends infinitely in either direction from the mean now we've seen the normal distribution before but this is more formal um, the fifth property is really special there's what we call a point of inflection which is a change in concavity um, at these two points mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma so one standard deviation above and below the mean in any event this is what the normal distribution looks like get used to sketching it just draw a horizontal line to represent the x-axis and our standard bell-shaped curve and notice how I'm above the x-axis to indicate the asymptotes it's symmetrical about the middle which we always label as our mean mu and then as we've seen with the empirical rule if we label three standard deviations on either side of the mean it encompasses 99.7% of the data, so almost all the data. And this would be mu plus a standard deviation, so each bar represents the distance, represents a standard deviation. So this would be mu, the mean, plus two standard deviations, or two sigma. This is mu plus three sigma. In the opposite direction, minus mu minus a sigma mu minus 2 sigma and mu minus 3 sigma and we use that for the empirical rule but now the idea is that we want to be able to find areas in between not exactly a multiple of a standard deviation away from the mean like we did earlier with the empirical rule to um, describe the normal distribution a little bit more in depth um, Let's consider the fact that the position and the shape, so those are two different things. Position is one thing, shape is another, are determined by the mean, determines the position, and the standard deviation determines the shape. So for example, these little exercises here will show us it asks on the same set of axes sketch a pair of normal distributions with the given characteristics all right means are equal we use the subscript mu sub 1 and mu sub 2 so 1 and 2 are two different curves so if I draw the number line the curve 1 has a bigger standard deviation now we know standard deviation means the spread of the curve so that might be if that 
represents curve 1, then curve 2 is a standard deviation that's smaller. Now the mean is down the middle. Now the means are the same, so mu1 equaling mu2 means the peak is going to be the same. But curve 2 has a smaller st standard deviation. So therefore it's not spread out as much. So it might come in like this. Which is still a normal distribution. Okay. Um, in the second part, the standard deviations are equal. So the spread is going to be the same. But mean of 1 is less than the mean of 2. So we could draw maybe a distribution here. Call that mean 1. But then mean 2 would be essentially the same shape. Because the standard deviations are the same. But notice that the means are different. Okay, and then here we have the means are different and the standard deviations are different. And again, standard deviation of 1 is less than the standard deviation of 2. So, or it's the opposite situation as, as uh, the earlier example. So, if 1 standard deviation is smaller than 2, it's going to be a taller peak. It's going to be more condensed. And there's the mean. And 2 will have a bigger standard deviation, so it'll be more spread out. And 2 is has a bigger mean, so it's more to the, to the right on the number line. So it might look something like that. So that gives you a good feel for how the standard deviation and the mean affect the normal distribution. Okay, on the next page we have the standard normal distribution. Um, the idea is basically that you can't, when you have a really large set of data, it's typically normally distributed. But the means and the standard deviations could be different. For example, if we talk about the mean height of men, let's say their mean height, let me just get this as an example. Let's say the mean is 5 foot um, 8 inches with a standard deviation of 3 inches but then if we talk about women and their mean height the mean height of women might be 5 feet I'm just making these up so these aren't necessarily true 5 inches and maybe the standard deviation is only 2 inches the point being that they're really large sets of data that are more than likely normally distributed but their means and their standard deviations are different. So what we do is we standardize, and that's why we call it the standard normal distribution, where we standardize in a way such that the mean is going to be equal to zero, and the standard deviation is going to be equal to one for each set of data. And the way we do so is by our familiar z-score. Um, so that represents the number of standard deviation that a particular data value or x value lies away from the mean. And we could use the formula we've used in the past. And this is on our formula sheet. So if you look at our table under key, excuse me, our key formulas uh, packet, that you should be familiar with. You see our z-score formula in both words and symbols. Please try to get used to the symbols. And it's x minus mu over sigma, meaning the data value minus the population mean 
over the population standard deviation. Um, as we know, now we know um, these characteristics, negative z-score were to the left of the mean, positive z-score, oh, z-score of zero were at the mean, so z-score of zero means they were equal to the mean, negative were to the left, positive were to the right of the mean. So if we draw the normal distribution and the standard normal distribution, they basically look the same. That is, our normal distribution, but the labeling is different. See, our normal distribution, we draw the normal, you know, our standard bell-shaped curve. The mean goes down the middle, and if we mark off three standard deviations like we did before, mu plus sigma, mu plus two sigma, mu plus 3 sigma, and to the left, 1, 2, 3, mu minus sigma, mu minus 2 sigma, mu minus 3 sigma. But when we standardize, the labeling on the x-axis becomes different. The, the shape is still the same. It's still a bell-shaped curve, normal distribution. But now, when we standardize, we're talking about these values with respect to z-scores. See, these are all x-values. And the z-score for the mean is 0. If we mark off three standard deviation, those three standard deviations, um, one standard deviation is z equaling 1, because z represents, as we said up here, the number of standard deviations the data value buys away from the mean. So we'd have z equaling 2 and z equaling 3, and then in the opposite direction, z equaling negative 1, z equaling negative 2, and z equaling negative 3. So we have a table that gives us what we call the left cumulative areas. So this was sent as an email and is also posted in Blackboard. Um, there's a separate file for tables, and um, it gives the areas. Okay, remember area, probability are syn synonymous. When we say area, it's the same as saying probability. And we generally give them as percentages. And the important thing about the table is that you understand that it's gives these left cumulative areas, the amount of area to the left of a particular data value. Now here's what the table looks like. We have the first page, and it illustrates with a diagram that it is left cumulative, because it's saying there's the x value, or the z-score, excuse me, and this is to the left, in the ta left tail. Um, and these are the respective z-scores. We'll read this table, z-scores to the nearest tenth here, and then here's the nearest hundredth. We'll look at, see some examples momentarily. So there's a, one page with the negative z-scores, and then there is a second page with the positive z-scores. And they've given you, us a little chart, and see how this is to the right of the mean if it's a positive z-score z is to the right of the mean, whereas when we had a negative z-score, z was to the left of the mean. So we'll get very familiar with that table. And here are the steps if you want some stepwise procedures, but you know, after you do a few of these, it should be natural. It should be a skill set that is instantaneous. Um, nothing you have to really have these steps for, but you want to uh, sketch the curve and uh, shade the desired area and label always label the mean down the middle. Um, calculate the corresponding z-scores if necessary by the formula and then use the table to find the cumulative areas and then find the area of the shaded region. So we'll see in these examples what we mean by that. First off, it wants the area under the normal curve, standard normal curve, to the left of z equaling 0.99. So I always draw the sketch. OK, 
Okay, we're given the z-score so we can go right to the normal distribution and say that down the middle is z equaling 0. I always label that. And to the left is 0 0.99. Negative 0 0.99 is to the left. So somewhere over here. We really don't care exactly where. It's just a rough sketch. But there, we know it's that negative 0.99 is to the left of the mean, so it's somewhere to the left. And we want everything to the left of that data value, so you could shade in the tail. So now we're going to go to table 4. And in table 4, we're going to be on the negative z-score chart. And we look for negative 0.99. Negative 0.9 is this row, and intersect this. Notice that that it's uh, it's built like a number line, whereas your 0.09 is on the left, and your 0.00 is on the right. So be aware of that. So negative 0.99 just intersect negative 0.9 with 0.09, and we should see 0.1611. Now what I always like to do, after I look up the table, that area is a left cumulative area. So I always draw an arrow to the left, like this, and label that area. So in this case, 0 0.1611. So therefore the area or the probability I'm looking for is that, 0.1611. Now, this asks us, so when you find area to the left, it's actually going to be the area in that you look up in the table. But now we'll look at this example, to the right of this z-score. So the standard procedure is to draw the bell-shaped curve and label the mean down the middle. We're just dealing with z-scores, so we'll call it z equaling zero. The critical value, I like to call these critical values, of z equaling 1.06 is to the right of the mean. So somewhere over here is z equaling 1.06. But we want everything to the right of that. So we would shade in this tail. Okay, if you want to extend that, maybe my diagram could have been a little bit better. Extending it, all that area is what we want. So now when I look up the area in the table, it gives me the left cumulative area. So everything to the left of that data value. Now, first off, we're on the positive z-score portion of the table. And it's 1.06, so 1.0. That row intersected with 6, looks like this column. So 0.8554, so the left cumulative area is 0.8554, but that's not the area we're looking for. Since the area underneath the entire normal curve is 100% or 1, then the area we're looking for is 1 minus the 0.8554. Which is 0 0.1446. So you'll notice that if you're looking for the area to the right of a particular z score, you always have to do 1 minus because of the table gives us the left cumulative area. Alright, so some more examples. in the area between. So we've got three situations. To the left, to the right, or between. And if it's between, okay, let's draw the normal distribution again. It's always good practice to label down the middle the mean z equaling zero. We've got two critical values here. One is z equaling negative 1.5 on the left. You might want to say negative 1.50. We typically are going to round every z-score if we have to calculate them as we will in the next section to two decimal places. And then somewhere over here is z equaling 
positive 1.25, so somewhere to the right of the mean. Again, these don't have to be to scale or anything. But if we want to shade in what we want, we want everything between those two values. So when I look up the z-score here for negative 1.50, it gives me that left cumulative area. And let's just see what that is. So we're on the negative version of the chart. And again, you got to be careful here. So there's negative 1.5 row, but the zero column is the last column. So negative 1.50 is 0 0.0668. So that's that area. 0 0.0668. And then the area to the left of this z-score, which is positive 1.25, is found on the table again. And go down to 1.2. And then over to the column 0.05, looks like it's 0.8944. So the area that we're looking for, if you consider to the left of this value is all of that, and, to, and we want what's between the two values, so if we take the larger and subtract the smaller, we're cutting off this portion and we're getting what's in between. So we'll take the 0.8944 and subtract 0.0668. So therefore, the area that we're looking for is Use your calculator if you want to to be safe. 8276. So basically, the three situations I always like to draw it and make sure that um, it's coming out the way we expect. Excuse me, but <coughs> the three situations are. If we're finding to the left of a particular value, it's the area in the table. If we're finding to the right of a particular value, it's 1 minus the area in the table. And if we're finding between two particular values, we subtract the areas. Always the larger minus the smaller, because it's always the area or probability is always positive. And we reinforce this with three more examples. Uh, stressing the fact that area and probability are synonymous. But it's pretty much the same thing, but see, we're using probability notation now. So the probability that z is greater than negative 2.19, so you just have to make sure you know how to read that correctly. But we proceed identically the same way. We draw the normal distribution, label the mean down the middle, with z scores, z is 0, it's a critical value is a negative. Somewhere over here to the left of the mean is negative 2.19. We want everything greater than that. So that's everything to the right we would shade in. But when we look up the area in the table, it's to the left. And I'll just trust that you know how to use the table at this point. And looking up a negative 2.19 make sure you check this it's 0.0143 but if I want the area to the right of that again area under the entire normal distribution is 100% or 1 so the area we're looking for or the probability actually let's be formal here I could say area but if to be formal the probability that Z is greater than the negative 2.19 is going to be 1 minus the area we just found of 0 0.0143 and that gives us 0 0.9857 <coughs> excuse me all right another example between 
probability that z is greater than negative 1.8 and less than 0. So this is nested between two numbers. Uh, again, proceed the same way. Draw our standard normal distribution. Mean down the middle of 0 is equaling 0. Negative 1.48 is a critical value. Just to the left. And z equals 0 is already labeled. So we want everything between those two values. So shade it in any way you like. And we have the two left cumulative areas. areas. So I like to always draw the arrows. Now you really don't need to look up a z-score of 0 because you know that there's 100% underneath the distribution, or 1, and the mean splits it in half. So that's going to be point, half of 100%, 50%, or 0 0.5000. But if you did look that up in the table, that's what you're going to see. I'll show you the table for that one because that's kind of special. Um, here's 0 0.00, 0 0.5, 50%, as we would expect. <coughs> so then we look up negative 1.48 on the table, and just make sure you check this, and you're comfortable using the table, 0 0.0694. So therefore, since this is between the probability that Z is greater than negative 1.48 and less than 0 is going to be the difference between those two values. Always the larger, in this case the 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0, because we always like to go to four decimal places minus the smaller, 0 0.0694. And so that gives us 0.4306. Okay, a couple more to practice. Um, here, see, it doesn't matter what side of the mean the values are on when you do these computations at the end. It just depends if it's to the left, to the right, or between because now we have two z-scores that are both negative. Okay, negative 3.24 is furthest from the mean. And negative 1.9 is closer to the mean. And we want everything in between. But again, these left cumulative areas like to draw those zeros, I think this helps. And then you go to the table, looking up a negative 1.90, we find 0 0.0287, and looking up a negative 3.24, we find 0 0.0006. And so, once again, it doesn't matter that they're on, you know, both on the same side. It could be on opposite sides, like we saw in example three. Um, but the probability is between these two values. So Z is greater than negative 3.24 and less than negative 1.90 is just the difference. Always the larger, in this case, 0 0.0287 minus the smaller in this case, 0 0.0006. And that gives us 0 0.00281. Now, here's a special example. We've got an OR. And OR, recall, means to add. So, when we do this particular one, the way it's set up, being that the one data value is negative 1.55. So here's my mean down the middle and a z-score 
of negative 1.55. We want less than that. So that's what's in the, that left tail. But then 1.55 positive critical values to the right of the mean. And we want greater than that. So that's what's in the right tail. So I'm going to show you the long way and then we'll just make a comment. First off, if you look up negative 1.55, you find 0 0.0606. And then, so that's the area in this tab. And then if you look up the negative or the positive 1.55, we find 0.9394. But the area in that tail is 1 minus 0.9394 because it's the area to the right, which gives us 0 0.0606, which is no surprise because these are symmetrical. So, because the z-scores were just opposites. So you really didn't have to go through doing the area to the left of this and then subtracting from one, because by symmetry, this area in this tail will be the same as this area in this tail, as long as the two z-scores are equal but opposite. So, in any event, at this point, the probability that z, no matter how you did it, is less than negative 1.55 or z is greater than 1.55 is going to be the sum of the areas in the two tails, 0.0606 plus 0 0.0606, which is 0 0.1212. Okay, so that's the end of section 5.1 notes, and so we'll see you when you are ready for section 5.2.